We can then look at, at certain countries. You can, you can go back here to 19, 1950 and we can, pick, we can pick there Iran. Iran 1950. We would like to compare Iran to, uh, uh, not France, Italy. Huh? We had Italy 1952, we had Iran 1952. We can also focus this a little more by, by doing like this. Uh, all nice interactive stuff here. Uh, so we can zoom it like this. Uh, and, 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 and what has happened? I can take away all the others, so we just focus on Iran. Iran was there in 1952. There was a hope for democratic development that was to be broken by the Western secret agents who, who crushed the growing democracy to control the aid. Uh, the, the, the oil in Iran, and then we had the Shah period, and then we had the Islamic Revolution. So what has happened in Iran? Figure, numbers on number of children per woman and life expectancy are surprisingly good in Iran. How do I know? Because I personally know the professionals who are in charge of the compilation of the data. There's quite a good collaboration in the uh, United Nations, and we know the people who do it. There are fake data coming out of North Korea and during a long period from Libya. But beside that, there are very few countries with fake data. Some countries invest very little in data. Some countries doesn't publish all the data they have. But this sort of data, uh, and it's sort, of, it's sort of impossible to fake it. It's like trying to fake the weather. It's impossible. You have satellites, it's known. So this is actually what happened you know, when, when, when Iran developed into Italy. Like, uh, uh, the eradication of smallpox was important, and then they came up here. This was the revolution when they forbid family planning, and the Ayatollah changed their mind, and they really decreased family size. And uh, today, Iran is up there. The Islamic Republic of Iran today had the same family size as Italy had 1979. And uh, they have the same length of life as Italy had 1969. They really catched up, and they did it very fast. So I used to say, in short, Iran is like Italy in 1970, but Mussolini is still in power. It's like a short summary. <laughs> and I don't say whether the majority voted for him, or if there was a fake election or anything, but a lot of people voted for him in Iran. So, so, but how do people know this? Do people know this? I was invited to lecture at Bonnier's uh, annual forum event. This is the media elite in Sweden. See, we are making a casino. We thought it was too vulgar for this school of economics, you know. But we have, we have developed a casino game where you can bet with chips where Iran is, where Morocco is, where Mexico is. You know. It's quite fun. And you win or lose. It's sort of a business model for our foundation if we would go with real money. <laughs> and, 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 and you see, Iran was there with... You hear me from the back? It's sort of... When I turn around, it changes. Uh, uh, you see Iran, that was Sweden 2007. Those violet, these, these dots, the small dots, that's the table at the Bonnier conference where they guessed where Iran was. So you can see that the Swedish media elite, you know, it was those running the TV channels, you know, the main editors of the journals and so on, you know, they are like 20 years behind their time. Uh, others are, academia used to be about 25 years behind their time, politicians, also students, like 30 years behind their time. Actually, the best one, and that's sort of regrettable for a person like me to admit, but investor so far is the best one. They're just like 16, 70 years behind their time. And, and, uh, but some, some know, some tables knew up here, you know. But mainly, we underestimate the catch up of the emerging economies. We do not understand that the world is converging. The world is converging. And there still are politicians who have, have, have the attitude that Sweden should maintain its advantage. It, it, it's a försprång in Swedish. It's difficult to, to translate the mentality of försprång uh, uh, to English. But, but that's a very strange thing. You know, Sweden has to specialize itself in a, in a new world where all countries will live more or less on the same levels. You have to specialize and you find out what you are good at. You will not be ahead in everything. That is proven every evening when I leave my work. Not every evening, but I stay in my little room in Stockholm every second evening. And 
when I go to the bus station there at Solnavegen, you know, with the other PhD students who work late, I can see that they are Arabs and Asians. The Swedish PhD students go home at seven or on, you know. But the tough ones stay on, you know, and they are catching up. And no doubt about it. I, I, like to, I like to have this observation of my personal life experience to fit with the data. That's when I believe statistics. When I can see that, that those who stand at the bus stand, they have the fastest economic growth. Like, you know? And those who go home early, you know, they have less sex. It makes sense to me. Huh? <laughs> and, 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 and this is what we did. Now, this is typical public health. Why do we have public health like here, you know? I, I, I used to show another, another example I used to show here is instead of Iran and, and this I can deselect here. I can, I can make them a little more uh, visual. Let me pick... Uh, uh, we go forward to wh when the war started here and we can have Vietnam there. You see Vietnam there and we take United States up here and then uh, you take the rest away and you can see what has happened between Vietnam and United States. It's amazing, isn't it? Vietnam, and they have very good data and United States have good data. Vietnam today has the same health as United States 1990 more or less than the family size. Vietnam today is healthier and have smaller families than United States had when McCain came home from the prison in Hanoi. And people don't know this. Al Gore jumped the stage and shook me and said, I didn't know that. I didn't have the slightest idea about that. And that, you can, that was Al Gore who loves statistics and you can imagine the rest of them. That means that the leaders of the United States of America, they don't understand what is happening in the world. They don't see what's happening. Because it's happening in the human dimension before it's happening in the economic dimension. And since it's happening in human before economics, it's also happening in human before military. So when I swap this axis to honor this school of economics, I have to put income per person, GDP per capita in purchasing power parity, uh, inflation adjusted, then we get this. You see, Vietnam is really lagging behind the United States in money. They've catched up because life expectancy accumulates educational level, family infrastructure, uh, modernization of concepts of hygiene, family planning, all this capacity and, and educational level also. So you have a good educational level, you have good human resources in Vietnam, and, but they, have, they just earn still $2,400 in purchasing power per year per person. Huh? And United States in 1950 here, some, 1964 they were there. So how far back do I have to bring United States here? I have to go back to like 1860. Vietnam are five to six generations behind in economy, but they are one generation behind in human resources. So which is the country in the world that, that Kamprad loves most? Did you hear him in the summer program this summer? Oh, no, Vietnam, he said, you know, long live Ho Chi Minh, he said, you know. Because Vietnam is probably the, the country in the world today and the country in human history where we have had the largest discrepancy between the human resource capacity and the educational level and capacity to produce with the income level. Never have I had such a skilled population at such a low income and so good, well organized, so densely populated. And the Vietnamese are really set for... 25 to 50 years of fast economic growth. And this is a big difference. You can see here, you know, the concept of the industrialization of economic growth, you know, creating good markets, is that the economy will drive the health improvement. And so it did in West Europe, because the health improvement required the scientific discoveries and the technology development. Uh, understanding of the importance of hygiene, 1855 we got public water supply in Stockholm and that was after the number of cholera epidemic and John Snow had proven in London that cholera was transmitted by water. It just took one year after that was proven to get the communal taxes to raise up and pay for money because it was so good for business. But in t in, until that, we didn't understand that it would be good to do it, you know. It, it was handled in, in, in other ways. Public water in cities. And the Romans knew it already. They had their aqueducts and they brought in... The, but this blood industrialization of Western Europe was so greedy, so vulgar, 
So it had to be repeated cholera epidemics bah, 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 until they understood they had to have safe water for everyone. It's really a very vulgar background in which this fantastic economic growth occurred. And I like Fared Zacharias. I hope you read Fared Zacharias from Newsweek and his post-American world. He really is the one who says that West Europe was amazing. What was created there with technology, science, freedom of, of, of mankind, a good market system was completely unique and it was very good for the world, but it was very vulgar, it was very violent, and now everyone knows what is bad and good and everyone will repeat. It's not stranger than that the European picked the numbers from the Arabs. Everyone will take what's good, so the rest of the world will catch up.